Senator, if you would uh, let us just be a, wait a minute more. We're waiting for our ranking member to, to join us. So hopefully she'll be here shortly. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a wonderful weekend. Uh, we will now open up the public hearing on Senate Bill 32. And the chair recognizes the prime sponsor, Senator Rosenwald. Thank Thanks you, for coming. Madam chair. For the record, I'm Cindy Rosenwald. I represent District 30. Hampshire over that period will receive more than $300 million to mitigate the harms of the opioid epidemic. When we receive a check from one of the companies that we're in litigation with, 15% of that money goes out immediately to 23 litigating subdivisions. It's counties and it's cities and towns, the balance goes into the fund. None of the money goes to the state. The Opioid Abatement Advisory Commission has a responsibility and authority to grant these monies for a variety of purposes that are laid out in statute. There are 22 members on the commission, and they represent subject matter experts HHS Corrections, the Department of Justice, county attorneys, the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs, physicians, specialists, and county and municipal governments. We held our first round of grant applications last fall for $6.6 $6 million. And at the beginning of this month, 14 contracts were awarded by the Executive Council for six, uh, $6.5 million. There's one outstanding contract that's not quite finished. Since that first round, more money has come into the fund, and we're just about to close a, an RGA for at least $5 million in grants to reimburse the cost of medications to treat substance use uh, disorder, um, to reimburse those. Question, can I interrupt? So what's an RGA? I'm sorry, a re request for grant application. Um, the, so this bill comes out of our experience in soliciting and awarding grants over the past year does several things. First, it establishes a requirement that we give out grants of at least $5 million at least once a year. So 
um, as long as there is at least $5 million in the fund, we have to give out grants at least once a year. And we have to collaborate with HHS on the number of times that we will do this in a year. If we go beyond two or three, it's going to be um, really overwhelming for the department. And I should note that it's very likely there's going to be at least $5 million in this fund every year for the next 18 years because of the way the settlements are structured. But currently, there's no statutory language about this. It's um, dealt with in rules. Second, um, the bill clarifies and makes a couple of additions to eligibility categories for grants. These are recommendations from the subject matter experts. It expands the reimbursement for medications for substance use disorder treatment to recognize that naloxone is not the only FDA approved substance. And finally, it updates language to reflect best practices in the field and fixes a couple of typos in the underlying statute. So I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, Attorney Buffetti, who has negotiated all these settlements at Justice, is also here. And he's, he's really the subject matter expert, but I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, so of course, we're the second committee on this, so we yes. will not be discussing the underlying policy. Okay. And we thank you for all your hard work on that. Um, so we're going to be focused more on the money side of things. Great. Could you just explain wh where did the $5 million come from? What, what was the decision on why? Why not $3 million? Why not $6 million? Um, <clears throat> We decided, so we had about 30 $35 million in the fund. Some of that is from multi-year settlements, but a big chunk of it was from a one-time settlement from Johnson & Johnson. We didn't want to create, um, we didn't want to start funding programs that would ultimately not be sustainable. So we thought $5 million was reasonable, but we allowed the department to increase that number. We have not yet seen what the total request will be. Let me say that in the fall when we went out to bid on $6.6 .6 million, we got $24 million in requests. So. There's a huge need out there. We think a lot of the reimbursement requests will be for county corrections for the cost of treating their, um, in, their inmates with either naloxone or um, buprenorphine or methadone. But it won't only be counties. There may be some local jurisdictions as well. So we might be able to decide to give out up to $10 million. Thank you so much. It was really just kind of a cautious Yeah. It's, okay. Uh, Representative Platt. Yes, I saw that you were reading. Do, do you have a copy of that? Um, I do. I can leave this with you. Thank you. Then, yeah. Other questions from the committee for the senator? Representative uh, Southworth, yes. Thank you for taking my question and thank you for all your efforts. Um, very important topic for me. I've heard in many meetings of the need, especially smaller committees, to get reimbursement for the Narcan and those other kind of treatments. But I also know grants are very complicated. So I'm hoping eventually there'll be an easy way for them to access that if they aren't a community that necessarily do a really big grant. So. That is part of our learning experience. Our first round of grant applications, we had a very long application. And we have determined that we're going to work to have shorter applications. And also by targeting some of the rounds, like 
the one we're doing right now is reimbursement only. The one we did last fall was for any of the approved uses. It will be easier, I believe, for smaller communities to apply for reimbursement or, or any other grant that we go out with. I think we'll be going out with grants again later this year and probably discussing it next in two weeks as our next meeting. Uh, thank you. I, I do think that that flexibility will really be helpful, especially if that's the main thing a community needs is Narcan reimbursement, because, of course, it can be very expensive. Mm -hmm. That if they know that's something they can apply for, I just think it would ease some of the stress. And thank you. Some of those communities may have applied during this round that's just about to close, but we don't know yet what has been applied for. Representative Almy. So before Representative Rung then, uh, I need to be close. I need to bring it closer. Um, that reminded me of something that I've been meaning to ask about the HHS's grant making process. Uh, there was um, a number of years ago, uh, our senior center was having to uh, send three digital and I think it was 30 paper copies of each application that they made to DHHS. Uh, we seem to have had to promote paper pushers when we, when after the Great Recession. <laughs> Do you know if that's been fixed? I'm not aware that we required anybody to submit yeah. multiple paper copies. Could you just ask? <laughs> Thank you. Representative Rung. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator, for taking my question. Um, are there any administrative costs that are taken out of this fund, and if so, what's the percentage? Yes, that's a great question. We agreed to fund one um, staff person out of this fund. The cost, I think, was between 85000 and 100000 a year, all in with benefits. The department has been asking for several more staff people. We have been reluctant to approve that request. It's a big request. We might, we might decide to fund one more, but we haven't come to agreement because we really want the money to go to mitigate the harms, not to hire staff. The Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs, which spends between, I think, 11 and $12 million a year, has one staff person. So they're a, they're a good model. Representative Malloy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, for uh, taking my question today. I'm interested in the grant application process. Uh, is when, when one organization applies for money, is the grant uh, a standard form uh, with specific questions and that everybody gets, or is the grant application uh, something that these organizations make their own case for, uh, and it's free form uh, process. Uh, in other words, I don't know if I'm asking the question quite right, but I is it is it this question and this question and this question and this question? I think okay. I understand your question. We had a standard application, um, and we knocked out a couple of applicants because they were not in good standing with the, um, with, what's it, the Secretary of State? Charitable Trust Unit. Charitable Trust Unit. So a couple of organizations applied and we just said, you know, you're, forget it. We're not even going to consider any nonprofit that's not in good standing with Charitable Trust. We're not going to give this money to get your house in order but we've had a standard application thank you very that much that we're going to try and make shorter thank you 
Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, Senator, I just want to make sure uh, that I understand the legislative intent from your perspective as the sponsor. So the $5 million is addressed in two sentences in uh, the first paragraph. So this is uh, the first page of the bill, lines 6 through 10. Mm -hmm. What I understood you to say is that you are wanting a legislative instruction that at least $5 million be granted each year. What this language appears to say is that grants will be made without specifying how much in any year that the balance exceeds $5 million. That leaves me with two questions. The first question is, where does it say that at least $5 million should be granted each year? And should it say that? Is that your intent? Yeah, I think I misspoke. It, it says, you're right, as long as there's at least $5 million in the fund every year, we would go out to solicit applications at least once. Um, it doesn't say that we have to give out Five million. There might be a year where we only have five million, and we decide to bid out four. So, I think we were comfortable with okay. this. So you're language. comfortable with what it says? Yes. And it and didn't I'm necessarily sorry, have to be a minimum of five. It does. Million. It does not. Okay. Second. HHS was concerned that we would decide. Oh, let's go out to bid every quarter. Okay. And that would be too much work. If you're so happy with it, I'm happy with we're it. We're happy with okay. it. Second, second question then. It looks to me, uh, given the pace of settlements, that uh, we won't be below $5 million, uh, in any given year anytime soon. But at some point down the road, as this moves into the 10 to 18-year range, mm -hmm. uh, what does this language indicate in terms of a year in which maybe there was only three or four million in the fund? Does it mean nothing can be granted in such a year? That's no. what it seems to say. I don't. I don't think so. It just means we don't have to. So the requirement is us is if there's at least five million, we have to give out grants at least once a year. Okay. So you you. I get what you're saying. Shall solicit applications mm -hmm. is an instruction if there are five million or more. You would not want it to be the case that if there were only three million in the funds, no grants could be made, right? No, I think, I because think we might want to spend what you have. Yeah. Right. Okay. And we could change it in fifteen years from now. Thank you. I'm glad to have your interpretation of the language. Thank it's you. the same. Representative Malloy, did you have another question? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you again, Senator. Uh, earlier in the in your testimony, you mentioned a, n a number of thirty-five million dollars, and I, I don't know if I heard this correctly or that I thought I heard that you have thirty-five million in this fund now. Mm -hmm. Is that that's correct? And Attorney Buffetti has the exact numbers, okay. but it's somewhere around that because we got a one-time settlement from Johnson and Johnson that's not going to be paid out over 18 years. So some of the money that's in the fund is the first payment out of 10 or 15 or 20, and some of it is lump sum. I think we're about to get a one-time payment from Walmart also. But if we give out all of that money right away, then we are not going to be funding sustainable programs. So we've tried to be um, realistic. We haven't given out necessarily one-year grants. We've said, Give us an application for something you would do over two years or three years. So we want to work with the requesters to mitigate the harms, but in a way that is sustainable. We have not yet had the opportunity as a commission to say, 
how much do we want to set aside for the future and give out more slowly? Follow up. So that's why you're protecting that corpus of 35 million at this point? Just to... for now. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? Representative Southworth. Uh, thanks again for taking my question. You partially answered it. Again, I was a counselor by trade, so I know this is a gigantic problem, uh, very complicated, uh, and even 10 years, we're probably talking 20, but um, as far as dealing with it, if not almost forever, it seems like what you're looking for in this is you really need flexibility on the financial side because you really, you know, as a commission, don't really know what you're getting into. I mean, in some, some extent, what's going to work, you know, how much each uh, attempt to uh, work on the problem costs. I mean, it seems like you really need flexibility as a commission and probably might even come back to us at some point. Um, we, do, we want both flexibility, but we also want a statutory requirement so that there's transparency of we're going to be giving out money at least once a year when we have a decent amount so that the public knows uh, what we're doing with it. And that, that statutory authority has not been there. Other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so thank much. Thank you. I'm going to have to run off okay. across the street, but um, I want to give Representative Platt my... Thank you. We appreciate that. Mr. Buffetti from the DOJ is here. Would you want to come up and maybe answer some of the questions we heard earlier, if you don't mind? Happy to. Welcome. Um, thank you very much. Uh, for the record, my name is James Buffetti. I am the Deputy Attorney General for since 2015, I have been the state's lead prosecutor prosecuting uh, our claims against opioid companies. Um, and um, I, I think it's, it's probably best to think of these as separate settlements. Each one was separate. Some of them came out of bankruptcy courts. Some of them have yet to be resolved in bankruptcy courts, most infamously Purdue Pharma. Which is, uh, which is tied up in bankruptcy litigation in the Second Circuit. Uh, I can tell you that to date, we have received slightly over $45 million in opioid money. Uh, as the Senator says, the statute um, requires that 15% off the top of whatever money we receive goes to 23 subdivisions, all 10 counties and 13 cities and towns. Why do they get the money? They get the money because they hired outside counsel from out of state to file their own opioid cases in federal court. And because of that, the legislature determined that they should and only they should share in this uh, in the fifteen percent, and it's done by population. So to date, to date we've received. Uh, I'm sorry, we have sent out six point eight four two million dollars to the twenty three subdivisions, and that money's already out. That money is already in their hands, and they are doing various things with that. Many of the counties are using the money to help with their cost of medication-assisted treatment, uh, which is the, probably the most effective treatment for people who are suffering from an opioid use disorder. <clears throat> Currently, in the, uh, in the opioid uh, trust fund, it's a dedicated trust fund, there is $31.7 million. If you deduct that $6.5 million that was just recently granted, uh, to those uh, those those those, those um, um, organizations that were able to get grants uh, approved by the governor and executive council, so that's thirty one million dollars. As the senator said, we will receive these payments in different amounts, in different times over the next uh, seventeen years. Uh, I think it's fairly it's 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 
a fairly sure thing that we'll receive at least five million, probably much more than that, uh, for that entire time. The, the largest settlement was with the three major drug distributors, uh, McKesson, Cardinal Health, and Amerisource Bergen. That, um, that was a hundred and, a uh, hundred and twelve million dollars over 18 years. So it's going to come in at about five and a half million dollars a year, I think. Um, there is some, some variation depending on the terms of the settlement. Um, we also have just, uh, we're just at the end stages of settling with um, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, and two uh, of the major manufacturers, a company called Teva and a company called Allegan. Those settlements are various amounts over various, uh, uh, various periods of time. Uh, but that's $100 million just for those five settlements. As the, as the Senator said, uh, if the Walmart settlement is finalized, then we should expect to receive about $15.5 million sometime this year alone. So I'm, I'm happy to answer. That's a lot. I'm sorry. There's a lot of, uh, of, of information, but I'm happy to answer any questions about where this money comes from, uh, the settlements, um, and what we can anticipate. The Senator is correct. I think that the estimate is in total, when this is all said and done, the state will receive slightly over $300 million over that 18 year period. And thank you very much. Are you, are you comfortable with the 5 million and the way this is worded? Does that help I am, yes. the situation? I should okay. also say I'm also a member of the Opioid Abatement Commission. So we've worked closely with that group. It's a, it's a diverse group and um, I'm comfortable with it. Uh, it's a commission that's working well. Uh, I, I, I think that the, the questions about, you know, the timing and the amount, and I think it, it's, it's meant for some flexibility. Um, we should anticipate at least one round of grant applications a year. I think it's probably more like two or three that we can do. We, part of that limitation is the amount of work it takes for HHS and their contracts unit to actually do this work and to make sure that everything is done properly and to make sure that the money is being used for the purpose for which it was intended. And that takes a lot of resources. But I think once, once we get into the groove, uh, I think that we should anticipate at least two or three grant applications a year uh, so that the object is obviously to get this money out as quickly as we can and to use it for opioid abatement purposes and no other purposes. Uh, it was from, from the beginning of this case, there was, it, there was strong intent by the, by the AGs across the country that this money be dedicated for opioid abatement purposes and not be diverted into other, other things. So I, I think the goal is to get the money out as quickly as we can so that it can get into our communities and to help people struggling with opioid use disorder. Thank you. Are you open to questions? Of course. Excellent. Sure. Uh, yes, Representative Bolton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, th this may not be in your bailiwick, but uh, regarding the one staff person that DHHS will receive, what would the function of that be? And it seems like if they're handling all the grant applications that are coming in, perhaps reviewing them and bringing them to the, commi the commission, um, is that it? Or is so, it I, so I, I have to correct, Senator. She was she has been uh, dedicated to the Senate Finance Committee work uh, the last couple of meetings. She missed the last meeting. In the last meeting, uh, the commission agreed to a second position. Um, and um, the, the chair, so the chair of the Governor's Commission on Alcohol was there. He's on the commission as well. He has pledged to try and find funding for at least one more position through the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs. So. As I understand it, it's, it's, it's easiest to think of these as what, what happens up front as these grant applications are being received and reviewed, uh, and then what happens at the, at the other end when that money is going out, and there has to be some sort of an audit function. So these two people will be on either end, or probably working together on all of it, but we'll make sure that, these, that each grant application has to be carefully screened uh, and then presented to the commission, and then when that money goes out, 
then there needs to be somebody that is checking on it to see that it's being properly used and that the organization that's using it has the ability to do what they say that they're going to do. And it's, I mean, this is, at the end, this is, you know, this is New Hampshire's money, and we want to make sure that it's being used wisely, properly, and it's going to the, to the best effect. Thank you. Representative Olmey. Thank you. Um, the alcohol and drug, other drugs, I don't think that's its actual name, but. <laughs> it is, actually. It's the commis oh, Governor's Commission the on Alcohol and, and Other Drugs. Uh, it, you, the I name stood on that as well. Over time. I yeah. was there when it started. Um, they, they are working on the wider part, not just other drugs, but also and alcohol, but on more on prevention and and on education. And one of the problems with concentrating just on naloxone and its and the others is that um, people take it and then go straight back to using again and take it again and again, and their brains go fuzzy. From what I understand, on um, are, are you collaborating with, is, is the commission collaborating with that commission uh, in terms of joint strategy, or are you going to? That, that's an excellent question, and um, it, it's actually in the bill that Senator uh, put together that um, there is a requirement now that the, that the commission works in coordination with the governor's commission, uh, and it's on in the first section, uh, line 13. So, um, and there are many of us that are on both commissions. So um, there has been a concerted effort to get uh, as much coordination as we can on this issue about how to best use the money to the best effect. So we're, we're, we're obligated, and we had been anyway, to talk to the Governor's Commission to talk to the, 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 the governor's coordinator on drugs, uh, Chief Mara, to talk to uh, as many as we can to make sure that we, um, that we can figure out what are the best strategies to use this money. And the, the statute that created the Opioid Abatement Commission has about 14 approved uses, including prevention, treatment, mm -hmm. transportation to treatment, transitional housing coming out of treatment. So m my guess is that there will also be um, some, some applications for prevention work in the schools. Last year, the legislature amended the statute to, to specifically allow for prevention uh, work being done in, in our schools. Um, and so I anticipate as things go on that there will be uh, applications to the commission for those kinds of projects as well. Follow up? Yeah, uh, so you may also be working in creating safe houses for people that are coming out of treatment that badly need not to be in drug infested yes. so, houses. Uh, so I can tell you that, for instance, in this last round, um, Sullivan County uh, is in the in the, is 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 in the process of rehabbing a building close to their jail for transitional housing, and um, so and Sullivan County is one of those counties that receives its share of the fifteen percent. But in addition, um, we authorized a grant of about a half a million dollars to help them with this project. Um, you know, th the experts that that do this. Uh, tell us that housing, transitional housing, is a, is a key need. So I think we want to make sure that we address that um, and provide options for people that need it. The other, one of the other key needs uh, in the North Country was transportation to and from treatment. And so one of the grants that we, that we uh, authorized was for a nonprofit to purchase two vans solely for the purpose of transporting people to and from treatment. Um, so we want to make sure that if, if somebody needs it, they have available treatment that they can get to in a reasonable amount of time. You know, New Hampshire, at one point, we, were, we had the second highest overdose deaths in the country, just after West Virginia, which is not something to be proud of. And so 
and that was many years ago, we've done an, an awful lot of work to address that issue, and that number has come significantly down. Um, we, we, um, we, we opened up these doorways programs, in, in mostly in hospitals, so that people can get to a treatment provider quickly and get connected with services. And we've done a, a lot, but we, we need to make sure that if, if somebody needs it, they can get to treatment quickly and that they don't overdose. Uh, o overdose deaths are still on the rise, uh, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, to, to, to address that. But I think we've made progress, and we need to just figure out how we can continue doing that. What is the greatest need? And that's going to change over time as this crisis changes. And so the commission needs to be flexible, again, needs to talk to the Governance Commission, needs to figure out what, is, what, are, what are the best strategies for now to, to address the crisis as we see it, and then try and fund programs that, that do that. Representative Southworth. Thank you for taking my question, um, and thank you for the context you've been giving us. I still want to follow up a little more uh, about the cost of the uh, medicines like Narcan, because I know it might have been a year ago I was in a meeting, and you might have even been there, where a number of people were saying, can't you just pay for the Narcan or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I assume probably you haven't made a decision yet about to what extent you're going to pay for those things, um, but I wondered if you have a sense yet of what actually would be the annual cost to support New Hampshire communities in that one part of the program? I, I don't, that's a good question, Representative, thank you. I don't know, I think we're gonna find out when we see this, this, this next round of grant applications coming in. So this, this grant application was specifically designed for the reimbursement of naloxone and okay. for, for uh, suboxone. So it was, and it's geared toward you know, cities and towns, counties, who are who are having to use this. I mean, one of the reasons that our, uh, reasons that our overdose death rate has come down is the amount of naloxone. Right. But nalox, let's be clear, naloxone is not a treatment drug. Naloxone is a rescue drug. It it prevents people from dying on the spot uh, because opioids have a, an effect of suppressing uh, a person's uh, respiratory system. So it, uh, if you ever see it, there are, there are actually YouTube videos and you can see an actual patient being given naloxone and they come back to life. Um, and so, but they're, but they're critical, right? Mm -hmm. And then the hope is that you can now get them into treatment so that they don't overdose again. Uh, but that's a cost. And so a lot of, um, a lot of first responders have it, uh, but there's also been a lot of work being done by HHS to make naloxone available to people who have an opioid um, script. So, you know, it, it should be that if, if, you're, if you're properly on an opioid prescription, that you be given the option to also get naloxone to carry in your, in your pocket like an EpiPen, so that if something happens, you have something to, to use. Uh, and, and so I think, I think we'll find out how many, how many people apply for that and how much that is. But it's going to be it's going to be um, millions of dollars, I think. Follow up. Yep. I, at least for me, um, it would be great um, if we could um, have figures on what if um, these grants covered all of the rescue drugs. Maybe if that could be a category, um, because I just think that's where I'm hearing a lot of things about people really wanting to use them, but also wanting to know that there's a reimbursement, especially in smaller communities. I think that would be important data to have, uh, as because you know there is a there is tracking that is be, that's being done by the Department of Safety of of the amount of naloxone that is given out. Um, so we we it's it's not perfect data, but we have some data, and indicating that it's actually you know been significant and it has had an important effect on on helping um, uh, get that overdose death uh, rate down. Thank you again. Representative Ames. This is more a comment than a question, uh, question, but I just wanted to thank you for your extraordinary work producing over $300 million with, of course, many others at your side. I recognize that, but it is extraordinary. And 
uh, perhaps a drop in the bucket when we consider the magnitude of the issue that you're trying to address intelligently and with the help of all the others that are on the commission. So many thanks. Thank you. Ditto. Representative Fellows. I just wonder if you can give me a clarification on what was being said about staffing. Yes. Because is that in some other part of the RSA? Because the part that we're looking at doesn't say anything about paying for administrative costs. It, it, it doesn't. That's a good question. It's not in the, in the bill. Uh, it was anticipated that there would be some administrative costs um, simply because you just can't you can't award this money and do it properly without some administrative costs. So the commission had voted to uh, to recommend that we have uh, that HHS hire two people. One's already been hired and has uh, started. So are, how are you? How are those people going to be paid? Are they supposed to be paid out of this fund, or yes. it does it? It doesn't. Is it in some other part of the statute? Because this part here doesn't have any provision for paying a, a state sta staffer. It it is not in the in the statute. There's no mention of it in the statute as it currently exists. There's no mention for the uh, the payment of administrative administrative costs. costs right. Representative Ullery and then Representative Susan Almy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, probably one of the few people in here who's actually administered naloxone. Um, and it does work rapidly. However, I've also administered it to the same person more than four times. Sadly, yeah. Does the department, do, does anyone anywhere have any record as to how many times that, because how many times there have been multiple applications of that emergency drug to the same person? My experience in the field was no one takes the, the treatment, which has some of the same parameters as alcoholism, having to reach bottom, et cetera, uh, as seriously because they're not facing death because I'll get a shot and I'll be saved uh, as an excuse in their in their own mind. So, are there any records on that? No, and and um, so safety has they have some records. As I said, it was not perfect data of the amount of doses of naloxone that has reported to them that's been administered, but they don't have data. And I'm not sure they could do it. They don't have data on how many doses have been given to uh, to the same person. Yeah, yeah, Ooh. because. Oftentimes, depending upon transport time, because it's it's a short-acting uh, drug that's a, a short period of time, and there may be multiple doses within the hospital while they detox the person. I understand that, um, but there should be, in my opinion, some record keeping. I would hope you would take that back. Um, when these the follow-up uh, question, Madam Chair. Yes, as long as it's pertaining to the money aspects of this bill, which yeah, is our focus. Simply. Thank you. The well, this one actually does. <laughs> <laughs> when the money that you've gotten from these companies that were fulfilling the contract expire, who's going to pay for this? Um, well, so we mean when that money stops coming in, right? Um, that's going to be 17 years from now um, when all that money stops. So I don't know where we are. I, I, I have no idea what the status of this opioid crisis will be in 17 years. Um, I think those are very good questions. Um, you know, there has been a lot of federal money that has come in for opioid use disorder work. So much of the money that goes into the doorways has come from federal opioid grants. And there is a question about what happens when that money stops. And there's indication that it's going to be at least reduced. So I think those are hard questions that will need to be addressed. Uh, it's, I, I anticipate that they are going to come to the commission and say, can you help make up some of this sh shortfall uh, because I think, I, I don't know offhand, but I think just to, to keep these doorways 
programs open. It's probably 50 or $60 million a year. A lot of it is coming from, I guess, a federal grants that won't go on forever. And I think we're going to have to figure it out. But again, we don't, I, it's hard to anticipate where this, where this crisis is going to go and what our needs are going to be 5, 10, 20 years from now. Okay, Representative Alming, did you have your hand up? Yes, you did. We were waiting for you. Hello, I'm uh, just trying to clarify on Representative, uh, I'm forgetting names again, fellows, <laughs> uh, uh, question. Um, is the, the position that is already hired now in the budget, the new budget, because uh, these things don't appear in statute. They appear in the budget. Right. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, uh, I know that the position, I know the position was created by HHS. I know that the funding for it would come out of this opioid. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that. And presumably was paid for, was uh, uh, agreed to by governor and council at some point. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Other questions on this side of the room? Anything else? Thank you very Thank much. You. You're welcome. Okay, I don't have any other pink cards. Anyone else here would like to speak on Senate Bill 32? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing on this bill. Okay, folks. Um, we will now break for caucuses and come back around 11 to uh, exec four bills uh, that are due. Representative Almy. Thank you. I may have missed this. I'm, I'm uh, sorry. There's quite a lot of uh, construction going on on 89 now, and I've got some other problems. But uh, I've got Senate Bill 113 in front of me. We we also did, and we have inquired of Karen, and she said that was a mistake. So ignore oh, that. <laughs> so what we have, uh, we have four bills that we will attempt to exec today, and we really need to get them done today because we're up against deadlines. So uh, hopefully we can do them efficiently, but we might need to give it a few hours if there's other amendments that need to be made. So uh, let's plan to meet back here at 11. Thank you. Oh, and welcome to our new members for the day. The substitutes will introduce you when we come back. Thanks. Uh, the Republicans have a room up on the third floor.
Okay. Good morning again. Welcome back. Uh, we will open up our executive session on four different bills today. Uh, but before we do, we'd like to welcome our substitutes today. Can we go around the room? Representative Smart? Hi, welcome. <laughs> Where are you from? Um, District 2, Belknap County, Meredith. And um, hi, everybody. Hi. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Representative Lloyd. Hi, Crystal Lloyd from Nashua. You must like us because this is becoming a habit. <laughs> yeah, you guys tend to be my favorite to sit in and sub with. That's so. awesome. <laughs> and then over here, Representative Rung. Yes, uh, Rosemary Rung, uh, uh, Hillsborough District 12, which is the town of Merrimack. And Representative Hawkins Phillips. Hi, yeah, back from Hanover and Lyme. And it's always a pleasure to be back on Ways and Means. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here today. Okay, first on the docket, we will open up the executive session on Senate Bill 32. And the chair recognizes Representative Spillsbury for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move OTP on SB 32. Is there a second? Representative Elberger seconds. Representative Spillsbury, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you. So uh, our focus is principally on the uh, $5 million uh, item. And uh, I was glad uh, that I was able to have a colloquy with uh, Senator Rosenwald and uh, would like to uh, make sure that <clears throat> our committee report provides the necessary legislative uh, intent to ensure that this is understood to say the department must have at least one RFG round whenever the fund is over $5 million, but that does not preclude them from uh, providing grants when the fund is under $5 million, and it does not mean that they have to spend at least $5 million. So uh, with uh, uh, consent and understanding of the committee, I want to make that explicit in the committee report. Other comments? Representative Almy. Thank you. I think it should also put the the maxima, maximum idea in there that on the fund is being created by a mixture of long term of of one time and uh, serial on on contributions on from the settlements and can be used in larger amounts in some years than others. Agreed, and I'll make that clear too. Other comments from the committee? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you. Uh, Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Ullery. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Pletbos. Yes. Representative Smart. Yes. Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Orris. Yes. Representative Rochefort. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Lloyd. Yes. Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Elberger. Yes. Re Representative Rung. Yes. Representative Hatkin Phillips. Yes. And the chair. Yes. The vote was 20 to 0. I'm not sure we can put this on consent, but if we can, is everyone okay with that going on consent? Yes. Okay. So the vote being 20 to 0 ought to pass. Motion carries. And that closes the executive session on Senate Bill 32. Okay. We will now open up the executive session. Yes. I've been advised two different ways on that. So what I will do is I will recognize you for ought to pass with your amendment, and then you can induce your amendment, and we'll see if it passes or fails, and then we'll go from there. Sound good? Okay. Okay, so we'll now open up the public, uh, excuse me, the executive session on Senate Bill 49, and the chair recognizes Representative Fellows uh, for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
I'd like to move for Senate Bill 49, Amendment 2023-20318H. Is there a second? Is there a second on the amendment? Well, seeing none, the motion fails. The bill is now open for another amendment. Chair recognizes Representative Ullery. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I move ought to pass on Senate Bill 49 FN. Is there a second? Representative Orr seconds. Representative Ullery, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, not really, but <laughs> <laughs> we've heard enough on this, uh, this bill between the one that I offered and this one. Um, the purpose is to provide some uh, uh, bridging uh, because of the existing law, which lapses all of the funds into the uh, general fund each uh, biennium. In addition, um, uh, the way that uh, this bill is written, it includes a, a provision to reduce licensing fee costs to individuals requesting permission to do a business in the state of New Hampshire. So thank you. Other comments from committee members? Representative Phillips. So thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I can't support this as written because of my concern about, for, for t actually I have two concerns. One of them, it's not drafted correctly. The, um, the, there are parts that are new language that are not highlighted that would leave somebody to believe that they um, that uh, the OPLC already has the authority to lapse money um, for capital projects, and that's not in current statute. Also, it conflicts with HB. 655 which is the a big bill it's like oh i don't know like eight pages or so that reorganizes oplc and that has passed the house and the senate and it's on the way to the governor's office and this particular statute within 655 um, says that the fund shall be separate and dedicated non-lapsing continually continually appropriated to the office for the purpose of paying all costs and salaries associated with the office. Um, it does not say anything about restricting it specifically to capital expenditures. And um, the third thing is that we heard that um, the commissioner, the commissioner, um, the executive director of OPLC was interested in purchasing a building and existing statute makes it very specific that it's the responsibility of admin services, their division of purpose of uh, purchasing properties to make purchases of buildings and also to execute long-term leases of which OPLC currently has leased facilities with seven more years left on that lease. Um, and so the process would normally be for any agency that wanted to have a new facility or a new lease, they would go through purchase and property to identify what you know, if it was needed, what facilities might currently be available to them, and then it would go through the budget process and the, the entire budget process. It would be put in the budget going to the governor and work its way through the House and the Senate. So this language, which I th think in terms of restricting it to capital, appears to give them the authority to make capital purchases, which current statute just does not allow. So there are just some issues with this. I do, abs and that's why I had an amendment which dealt with the three million, you know, put the three million cap in there, but um, which I think everybody's on board with, but maybe not, um, and just address those technical issues. Thank you. 
Thank you, Representative. And just so you know, uh, Representative Fellows did some research on what Administrative Services does and has some handouts for you if you're interested. Okay, any other discussion on Senate Bill 49? Seeing none, the clerk will call. Oh, I apologize, Representative Almy. Yes. Um, there is that section that the Senate put into law and the drafting did not uh, did not indicate that that section was actually new, so that everybody's been under a false impression of what the law was originally, that I find um, very irritating, <laughs> frankly, and, and think that we probably ought to do something about that. Um, and... So I'm, I'm just looking at this now and realizing that I don't see in the bill that we're talking about the cap of $3 million or any cap on the lapse, any lapse change. Okay, am I? Which one am I? Yeah, it does seem like my version is wrong here because I know I've read that elsewhere. Yeah, mine was revised and dropped at this break. No, that's a report. Oh, yeah, here it is. Yeah, right. Okay, I don't know where this version came from. It's from a Senate, amended by the Senate, but. Okay, other okay. Con comments? Um, I do wonder if there's anything that we can do to, to indicate that the law is being changed here on those section, that section that uh, Representative Fellows has pointed out without changing the rest. Jennifer, hi. Could you come up, please, and help us? A quick question for our researcher. Uh, there is some language that wasn't highlighted when we received it from OLS. Is there a way to get that done now? Uh, or And apparently this language was not highlighted inside the Senate either. The drafter just didn't do it. I did contact the um, the drafter, and she indicated that there was an error when they were working on this bill. Um, that error is not present in the House bill version, um, but it is present in this version. Um, she did suggest an amendment to correct that. Could we do that on the floor? I don't see why not. Yeah. yeah, and just just so you know, Representative Fellows and I spoke last week about this, and I thought there was going to be a separate bill that did that didn't happen. Right. So we could well, do if it's a technical it fix like with that. The, the one that got rid of the capital. Fund yeah. Part. Okay. So we could do if if that's something simple. It's not just like a major policy change, right? It's just a correcting of what's bold. Is that? Yes. Yeah, she she um, characterized it as like a copying and pasting error, like the formatting didn't enter into the program as she expected it would when she went back and reviewed it again um, when I asked the question. So it's not anything substantive. It, it's just an unexpected word processing <laughs> error. Yeah, Representative Ulrich? A question of Jennifer and Ms. Floor. Do Scribner's errors require, such as this, require an amendment, or can that be just be considered a Scribner's error and be corrected by a uh, two-person uh, I could meeting? follow up to ask specifically whether this is something they could correct in enrolled bills. When I asked her about the problem, she suggested an amendment 
rather than suggesting that enrolled bills would be able to take care of it. So it's, I'm not 100% certain, but I could follow up on that. Would you please, and sorry to put you on the spot. I'm, no, no thank problem. you for being here. <laughs> no problem. Awesome. Okay, so we'll ask her to do that research and let the committee know. And if we feel, if, if it turns out that we need to do a floor amendment, we can certainly do that. Okay. Uh, any other hands up to make comments on Senate Bill 49? Okay, seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. And the motion before us is ought to pass. What would we do if she says we need an amendment? Then one of us will have to do a floor amendment. Oh. But, uh, no later, it has to be done until the clerk, no later than 4 p.m. the prior day to session. There's no session this week, so it'd be for next week. So we have a little bit of time, I think. Okay, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Chanigian. Yes. Representative Ullery. Uh, yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Platt votes yes. Representative Smart. Yes. Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Ors. Yes. Representative Rochefort. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative, Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Lloyd. Yes. Representative Fellows. No. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Elberger. Yes. Representative Rung. Yes. Representative Hecken Phillips. Yes. Uh, and the chair. Yes. Okay, that's 19 to 1. The vote being 19 to 1, ought to pass, motion passes. Uh, I believe it could go on the consent calendar. I'm not sure. If, <laughs> that's right, we don't want it on the consent calendar, so we'll put it on the regular calendar. Okay. Exactly, right. So we'll put it on the regular calendar, um, and we will close the executive session on Senate Bill 49. Okay, we will now open up the executive session on Senate Bill 112. And the chair recognizes Representative Ullery for a motion. I move to retain. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Elberger. Representative Ullery, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, there are questions. And there are questions. And there's a couple of questions. Therefore, I question whether or not we should pass it. Other comments from the committee, Representative Elmy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that most of the people on the committee would like to use this opportunity to, uh, to figure out what problem gaming uh, treatment is doing in this state uh, and if there's any way we can make it work better. On and we we also have a bit of a mess with how you treat breakage. <laughs> Representative Platt. We have a aversion to online gaming. This is online gaming. Mm -hmm. mm, this is a different bill. This is um, more the breakage issue. Remember, we went through all the math equations and so forth. Okay. Other comments on Senate Bill One Twelve. Representative Fellows. So just to identify some more of the questions, um, one of the things we know is that for paramutual racing that not all the racetracks are using the same breakage. And um, the other concern is like, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I had no idea how they're dealing with breakage on the historical horse racing machines which is so we definitely need to understand what what's going on with that breakage how that works representative ames 
And just to emphasize uh, Representative Almey's note uh, about problem gambling I, or gaming, you know, I see these words used interchangeably. I sometimes wonder about them, gaming and gambling. Um, but um, I see this as one more opportunity. There's also a study commission to look closely at, to surface the issue of problem gambling and uh, to see what we're doing about it already and what we ought to be doing about it and how it's affected by um, the expansion of legal gaming into what we now recognize are casinos in New Hampshire. Um, so I look forward to um, working with this bill as a retained bill and anything else that's there that can be part of this uh, to um, see if we ought to be doing uh, a better job on addressing the, uh, the downside of expanded gambling. Thank you, Representative Almi. Did you have another comment? Oh, sorry. Okay. I should mention that I am involved in the charitable gaming industry. I didn't think about that with this bill because I don't think it directly impacts me. But any other comments? Seeing none, the, so the motion is to retain. Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Janigian. Yes. This is to retain. Representative Ullery. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Platt votes yes. Representative Smart. Yes. Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Ors. Yes. Representative Rochford. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Lloyd. Yes. Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Elberger. Yes. Representative Rung. Yes. Representative Haken Phillips. Yes. Is it Hacken Phillips or Haken Phillips? Hacken, like a computer hack. Okay, thank you. Hacken Phillips. <laughs> um, and uh, the chair. Yes. The vote is 20 to 0 to retain. The vote being 20 to 0, the retained motion carries. One ninety. I'm all set. Did this in advance. Okay. We will now open up the executive session on Senate Bill One Ninety, and the chair recognizes Representative Doucette for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move we retain SB One Ninety FN. Is there a second? Representative Orr's seconds. Would you like to speak to your motion? Very briefly, uh, as with the previous bill we just retained, there's many questions that remain unanswered here. Uh, any expansion of gaming in the state needs its due hearing and due diligence. And I think we have the time and the availability to take care of that, and we shouldn't rush into judgment on this. Other comments from the committee? Representative Phillips. Um, yes, I, I agree with um, the idea to retain it. Uh, some of my concerns are, how is this even any different than sports betting? And why isn't it under, you know, under that? Um, we know that Seabrook already has the, what do you call it, the advanced deposit. They, it's at the brook. They actually are holding money on deposit for the races and their rate is 1.2%, not the what's proposed in here. And I think that my biggest concern is that when you have to, if you move this to essentially be, you know, online, that you, we probably are getting less revenue than we would get if it's done in person because people that are in the casinos, not only are they they betting money, but they're also buying liquor and they're buying food, and, and the state is getting revenue for that. So this is really a tiny slice of money that we would be getting, and it just uh, the whole concept doesn't work for me. Thank you. Other comments from the committee? Representative Orr's, did you want to say anything? Just checking. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. On this side, any comments? Okay, I'll say it again. I'm part of the charitable gaming industry. I don't think this impacts me, but just for the record. Uh, what are the odds of it affecting <laughs> me? 
Um, the motion before us is on retain. <laughs> the clerk will call the roll. Okay, the motion is to retain uh, Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Ullery. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Plett votes yes. Representative Smart. Yes. Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Ors. Yes. Representative Rochefort. Yes. Representative Almy. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Lloyd. Yes. Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative uh, Elberger. Yes. Representative Rung. Yes. And Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. And the chair. Yes. The vote is 20 to 0 to retain. The vote being 20 to 0, the motion carries, and we will retain this in committee and close the executive session on Senate Bill 190. I believe we are done. <laughs> so great job, everyone. Uh, very efficient. Uh, I think that's all we have left to do on our committee at the moment, um, unless we must produce revenue updates or something like that. I'll keep you posted if that comes up. The speaker has said that there will be no meetings in July or August. Yay. So we got to plan on June, though. There's a lot going on in June, so be here. Um, but um, we will meet in September, and we'll probably start with just like a work session to talk about all of the retained bills. I've lost count now, but it's over a dozen. Um, so we'll go through that list and see where we are and, and then maybe schedule further work sessions with experts to educate us further. And we also talked about September maybe doing a little welcome back party. So stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you.